All right. Um, so I'm interested in a class of cases, uh, generally speaking, I'm interested in a class of cases which I call mismatch cases or discordancy cases, they've been called in the literature. And I'm interested because, well, I think they're intrinsically interesting, actually. Um, but one motivation to be interested is whatever your view of belief, you're going to think that there's a close tie uh, between believing and behaving. So you know, on some views, that's a constitutive link. So there are people who believe that uh, to believe that P is partially constituted by a disposition to behave in certain ways, uh, ways that would be rational were it the case that P. Uh, a lot of people have a weaker view. It's not a constitutive uh, view, but unless you think that beliefs are idle, unless you're an epiphenomenalist about uh, belief, uh, I think everybody thinks that beliefs play an explanatory role in our behavior. Uh, you can uh, deduce what people's beliefs are from their behavior. Beliefs, on many views, beliefs cause behavior. But almost everybody will buy that they play a, a predictive and an explanatory role in our behavior. So that makes mismatch cases interesting. Because in a mismatch case, we have reason to think that somebody believes that P, for some proposition, or, uh, whatever it might be, but they don't behave in a way that matches up with that belief. Very often, they say, and pretty much all the mismatch cases, I think, they assert that P. But a lot of their behavior, uh, um, for their behavior other than assertion, seems to belie that belief. So there's a whole range of these cases. Setting aside insincerity, obviously the people lie. Uh, I'm just setting that aside. These are all cases in which we have good reason to think that there's an insincerity Insincerity is not in any simple way part of the explanation. So these cases are very, very familiar to all of us uh, for some part of them because they're very everyday. So some of them are weakness of will cases. I say I shouldn't have that drink, but I intentionally you know, shouldn't. The judgment on most people's views, that's a belief. But then I intentionally have the drink, whatever it might be. Uh, other cases which are relatively, well, they're, they're still very everyday. We all uh, experience them, them or know someone who does. Phobias, somebody uh, who might say, for example, I believe the spider is harmless, uh, but then is disposed to act in ways that suggest that you know, they don't believe it. Some of these cases are more pathological in the sense of the kind of thing that falls under the rubric of psychiatry. For example, uh, well, there's a whole range of mental disorders in which, as they say in the jargon, patients have good insight. That is to say, they know uh, uh, that they have the mental disorder and they know the ways in which uh, it distorts their behavior and cognition. So uh, a, a clear example is obsessive compulsive disorder. Not everybody with OCD has good insight, but most patients do. Uh, one common symptom is compulsive hand washing. Why do you wash your hands? They, say, they may say something like this. It's as if I fear contamination. And if I don't wash my hands, I get really upset because I feel as though I'm contaminated. But I know I'm not contaminated. So they, have, they believe that they're not contaminated, but and there are no contaminants, and washing doesn't do them any good, but they're motivated to wash. Uh, and then at the more extreme end, you get clinical delusions, uh, such as the Capgras delusion, 
in which uh, a person may say that somebody familiar to them has been replaced by a replicant. Notoriously, they, Kafka and other delusion sufferers, somatoparaphrenia and mirror misidentification and cotards and so forth, uh, notoriously they tend not to act consistently with the content that they assert tend not to. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. So for example, a common kind of case report, a man with Capgra who reports that his wife has been replaced by an alien replica, uh, but isn't particularly concerned about the fact that he's living with an alien, isn't particularly worried uh, about the fact that his wife's gone missing as far as he knows, and concern for her welfare. Quite often uh, delusion reports come up quite incidentally. Uh, for, you know, for example, a man with misidentification reports, it goes to the GP uh, for some minor comment and happens to mention, oh, and by the way, there's a stranger living in my bathroom. It's their own reflection in the mirror. Um, now, these cases are heterogeneous, and I want to emphasize their heterogeneity. I want to emphasize their heterogeneity because uh, I, s I think we should expect a matching heterogeneity of explanations of these accounts, of these um, cases. There are a variety of explanations out there in the literature, some of which I think purport to be hegemonic, by which I mean they, uh, they purport to be explanations, which explains the full range of mismatch cases. I don't take issue with any of those ca accounts here, except insofar as they claim to be hegemonic. If, uh, I think they may well be, all of them may be right for some section of cases. I, 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 I won't go through them. Uh, now, I'm happy to talk about them more in question time, but there are a number of accounts out there. There are, there are cases, there are accounts like uh, Tamar, Gendl Tamar Gendler's A leaf account, according to which we have B leafs and also A leafs, where A leafs are affective, automatic, associative states which may have contrary content, and um, w w the, the mismatch is explained by this mismatch between the conflicting representational states, or we shouldn't say representational, conflicting contentful states. Uh, there are, there are um, uh, conflicting belief accounts, Brie Gertle has got one, somebody can believe that P, and also maybe unbeknownst to them, believe that not P, uh, Eric Mandelbaum has an account like that for implicit bias. Uh, there are accounts especially designed to deal with delusions. Uh, there are a number of them, um, like uh, Phil Geron's um, default network account, according to which delusions are not beliefs at all, but default network thoughts, um, and so on. As, as I say, I'm not taking issue with any of them here. What I'm doing, in fact, is saying, yeah, there's this whole bunch of accounts out there. I'm going to add another one to the mix. Why should we believe uh, this other account? Well, because it uh, postulates only mechanisms and processes which we think should, which we should think exist anyway. And since these mechanisms and processes exist, and these mechanisms and processes can be expected to produce mismatch cases, some of the mismatch cases are going to be explained by uh, the account I'm going to put forward. I'm going to center the account, uh, well, I'm going to motivate it around a discussion of uh, a case from uh, Eric Schwitzgabel. Um, this is from a uh, paper by Schwitzgabel he recently put up on his website. It's an unpublished paper. There are similar cases uh, in Schwitzgabel's earlier papers, but this is a slightly different case, and I, I think it's an interesting case and a challenging case for the account I'm going to uh, put forward. Um, it's, and it's very important to me, of course, because um, I've given up doing sort of 
armchair philo or a prioristic philosophy um, uh, for a variety of reasons. It's very important to me that it's a realistic case, uh, which means uh, that not only it strikes us as realistic, but it, it better be compatible with all the data out there. There's the case of an agent that um, Eric calls Daniel. Daniel is, Eric doesn't fill in the details very much, but uh, he, uh, he says, this is an agent in, in whom I can recognize myself to a large extent. So let's assume he's a middle class, very well educated American. It fits with the other details of the case. Daniel purports to believe everyone deserves equal respect. But a lot of his behavior doesn't seem consistent with that belief. So, for example, this is more or less my way of filling it out, cashing it out, um, not quite it, Eric's. Uh, Daniel um, doesn't defer to, say, janitorial stuff in the way where he's not disposed to defer to janitorial staff, in the way he is disposed to defer to doctors and lawyers. So he's disposed to take what doctors and lawyers uh, say very seriously, even outside, you know, if they say something about um, where you can buy cheap gas uh, or who's going to win, I don't know anything about American uh, sports, who's going to win the Cardinals game, or whoever it might, or whatever it might be. So something well outside the area of their expertise, Daniel's more disposed to defer to them, to take it seriously, than he is to janitorial stuff. For example, he's more disposed to interrupt conversations between two fast food workers than between to academics. Now, Daniel is not simply self-deceived. Eric has cases, uh, similar cases in some of his papers earlier in which the agent very much like this, but is just self-deceived. They think they believe it, but they don't. Daniel's not like that, and for at least two reasons. One is a lot of his behavior is actually consistent with what he says he believes. And it's not just trivial behavior. Obviously, some of his behavior has to be, because we've, we've stipulated, Daniel says, I believe that everybody believes uh, that everybody deserves equal respect. That's behavior, that's assertion. But it's not just that. It's quite a lot of his behavior. So for example, uh, Daniel may vote for political candidates in a way that's guided by this belief. He may put his money where his mouth is. Maybe he donates to political candidates in a way that's uh, guided <coughs> by this belief. He tries to guide his behavior by this belief effortfully. He makes an effort and he quite often succeeds. Another reason he's not self-deceived is nothing's hidden from Daniel. Uh, Daniel would recognize all this description as true of himself. He'd say, yeah, that's what I'm like. I try, but I don't live up to my belief as often as I think I should. Sometimes I fail. Um, now, what should we say about Daniel? Truth Gable has an account, which, is, he's, which he's been defending for probably 15 years, and he thinks uh, the case of Daniel is just another illustration of how well his, his account works. Uh, Truth Gable's got this view of belief according to which uh, to, be, to believe that P is just to be, to be disposed to act as if P. It's, he calls it a phenomenal dispositional account of belief. Uh, it's a dispositional account, believe that P is to be disposed to act that P. He puts the phenomenal in because unlike earlier dispositionalists like Ryle, he wants to emphasize that these dispositions are not just cognitive and behavioral, but also affective. Uh, with the, the person who believes that P is disposed to feel certain things. For example, to be surprised if not be. Um, and he says, this, since there's nothing much, there's nothing more to believing that P than having a set of dispositions, but these dispositions don't cluster together nomologically. 
you can have some without the others, uh, then you should expect to find cases like Daniel. Some, somebody can have some of the dispositions and not the others. That's an in-between believer. There's nothing more to say about Daniel except to describe those dispositions in as much detail as possible. That's all there is to, to say about Daniel. Now, I'm not taking issue with any account here, including Eric's. You want to call Daniel an in-between believer, go for it. I have no trouble with that. I am taking issue with, okay, maybe I'm taking issue with Eric's account. Uh, I'm taking issue with the claim that there's nothing more to be said about Daniel, except describing his dispositions. I think there's a lot more to be said. I think we can flesh out the in-between belief case in a way which is consistent with a huge amount of evidence, which gives you mechanisms whereby the in-between believing state is generated. And not just mechanisms, but it allows us to say something about what the content is beyond saying, well, it's, you know, it's a bit PE and it's a bit not PE. I think we can say a lot more than this. So here's the account. I deny that Daniel believes that P. I don't think Daniel believes, at least for some realistic ways of cashing out the Daniel case, because maybe there are others, maybe there are Daniel A leaf cases, but for a very realistic way of cashing it out, and I, you know, I, I want to say that if there, there are other cases, then there'll be behavioral differences. Um, Daniel doesn't believe that P. He doesn't believe that everybody deserves equal respect. Not because he doesn't, he, he believes that it's not the case that everyone deserves equal respect. Rather, his first order state is a belief-y state that everyone deserves um, equal respect. Not a belief, but a belief-y state. Why is it not a belief? Well, beliefs are, I claim, states that have a functional profile. They are systematically poised to be evidence sensitive and to feature an inference. When I say systematically, I mean that towards that end of the, uh, the continuum. There are no ideal beliefs which are absolutely inferentially sensitive and absolutely evidence sen uh, sensitive. But a, a genuine belief is far enough along that continuum. Daniel's representational state is belief-y. It's, it's a taking of things to be a certain way, but it's simply too vague, too indistinct to qualify as a genuine belief. Daniel doesn't believe that P. What he does believe, he does have a belief, and that is a meta-representation. He believes that he believes that P. He believes, and he's right, that he believes that everyone deserves equal respect. Um, his, meta, his meta belief is a, a genuine belief. His first order state is not a genuine belief. And I'm going to claim that that complex state of this meta representation targeting a vague first order state gets you mismatched all by itself. Uh, terminology just for uh, brevity. When I say a meta-representation, uh, I mean that particular complex state. So, you know, a meta-representation is just a representation that targets another representation, but I'm uh, talking about a particular meta-representation, and I'm talking about the whole bundle. When I say a meta-representation, I mean a belief that targets, a higher-order belief, that targets a first-order belief he state. Obviously, there are lots of other meta-representations in the world. I can imagine that I believe something. I can believe that I imagine something, so forth. Uh, I'm not talking about those unless I mention that I am. Okay, so why should you believe the meta-representation account? As I said, because there are lots of meta-representations out in the world. Remember how I'm using the word meta-representation? And meta-representations can cause mismatch cases all by themselves without needing to wheel in anything further. Therefore, it's true. So a lot of what I've got to do in the paper is to convince you that meta-representations are true. 
I mean, are real, are widespread. I said, you meta believe it? I think you do. We all do. We all meta believe it. There are all kinds of stuff, propositions, which we take ourselves to believe, but we don't because we just don't have enough content for that first order uh, belief. Um, I think there are an enormous range of examples to be found. Um, I will, a, lo a lot of this is data-ish, it's sort of systematic observation. Some of it is just sort of not very data-ish, it's very everyday observation. Some of it's genuine data. Um, a lot of it I th you can find in the cognitive science of religion. Uh, mismatch cases are a, a commonplace in um, the cognitive science of religion. I guess started to be a thing, uh, a central strand of the cognitive science of religion with Justin Barrett's work in the late 90s. So uh, Barrett found that his subjects, this has been since been replicated ad nauseum because there's not a lot else going on in the cognitive science of religion. Um, uh, Barrett found that his subjects departed predictably from what he calls theological correctness. Where somebody departs from theological correctness when they know what their theology states, but they tend not to behave in relatively subtle ways, in ways that conflict with what the theology states. So the classic experiments by Barrett uh, used Christians, uh, and Christians who accepted explicitly standard Christian theology. Um, I don't remember what denomination uh, they were. Um, or whether they were a mix of uh, de denominations. In any case, they accepted that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Nevertheless, when given narratives involving God that didn't stipulate otherwise, they systematically interpreted them in a way that suggests a God that's not omniscient, a God that can be surprised. A God who finds things out that he didn't know. A God who acts sequentially, who has to finish doing this before he can do that. And so uh, this isn't to say that the Barrett's participants profess these things. It's rather that these served as assumptions in their interpretations of narratives. Now, I claim that's just what we should expect if people's representations of things like omniscience and omnipresence are pretty indistinct. And it's likely that they're going to be pretty indistinct. Why? These are very difficult things to represent. Um, I don't know to what extent Barrett knew the work, but earlier, before Barrett did the experimental work, or at least before he reported it, uh, Sperber actually predicted just that. Uh, Sperber, in his theory of religion, uh, suggests that religious ideas are going to have an advantage, they're going to spread culturally, insofar as they're hard to represent, because that makes them hard to refute. Um, and I think Sperber's right that religious ideas are often very hard uh, I'm, I don't want to take a stand on whether that makes them particularly uh, liable to cultural uh, replication or not but I think he's right that religious ideas very, are, very often are uh, indistinct in this kind of way um, since then, there have been many other observations of departures of the from theological uh, correctness or more generally of people's behaving in ways that seem prima facie to conflict with the religious ideas they accept. 
So, for example, Pascal Boyer, not coincidentally, I think, a student of Sperber's, um, reports quite a few examples from his own fieldwork <coughs> and from other people. Now, he reports, for example, very widely across the world, people sacrifice gods or ancestors and eat the food themselves. Very often, they don't, in fact, notice a contradiction here. It seems like there's a prima facie contradiction here, you know. Uh, if I eat the food, it doesn't be available for the ancestors. Uh, he reports that often they're just not bothered. Uh, we pointed out to them and said, well, whatever, have some food. Um, this is something he reports from his informants. He's uh, told by them, the ancestors are always watching us. He asked, do the ancestors have eyes? I mean, don't their eyes decay? And this question completely nonplussed them. Again, they're not particularly concerned. It's not like, well, oh my God, what, what, what do we say about that? It's more, ah, well, they don't have eyes, but they don't not have eyes. They just watch us. Have some food. Um, Dennett, in his polemic against religion, notes that um, a lot of people who profess that God is always watching them do things they wouldn't do if their mother was watching them. It again seems a bit of an inconsistency. <coughs> I think the best explanation of this range of uh, data, data-ish stuff, is that people actually have pretty indistinct representations. And I think some, some more data-ish stuff uh, kind of coheres with this. So there's been some work on death concepts, both in a Western context and in a non-Western context that Paul Harris has done. Uh, the uh, uh, Harris and Jimenez, or Jimenez and Harris, I don't remember which, uh, gave their participants who were Spanish children at a Catholic school, narratives uh, to prime religious con concepts or to prime medical concepts. Um, so one narrative ends with a little boy being told that his grandfather's died by a priest, and the other narrative ends with a little boy being told that his grandfather's died uh, by a doctor. And then uh, they, they ask the, the children about the mental states of the dead person. Or, in, in another uh, uh, ex experiment, the mental states of a dead, of someone from their own family who was dead. Uh, and what they found is that the children were much likely, much more likely to claim that the dead person had mental states at all after priming by religious um, narrative then with the medical narrative. As the child gets older, they are more likely to hold that the dead person has mental states. Much more extinctivist younger, increasingly get, like, uh, get disposed to dis uh, attribute mental states to the dead person, but nevertheless they remain significantly uh, context sensitive, much more likely to attribute mental states in one context um, than the other. Um, now, if you have a vague, acquired religious concept of death, you can expect it not to be particularly salient when it's not ethically activated, uh, when its inference isn't um, explicit, and you'd expect that kind of data. Um, and Harris and Astuti replicated this in a non-Western context, this time with uh, children and adults, younger children, older children and adults, got the same sort of um, pattern of results. This is the visa uh, uh, people who are small-scale fishers largely in Madagascar. Um, primed a ritual context versus a medical context and again found young children tended to deny that uh, pe dead people have mental states. Older children start to assert that they have 
mental states, adults do it, adults do it even more, but across all three groups, they remain significantly influenced uh, by uh, the prime, which is what you'd expect if the religious concept is in fact imperfectly acquired and pretty vague. Um, I think you see the same sort of thing with ideological, political and moral be beliefs. So just probably most of you here think of yourself as sort of liberal democrats and not in the sense of the party but in believing in liberalism and democracy. What does that commit you to exactly? If you have definite answers to <coughs> questions like are market freedoms genuine freedoms? Um, should free speech be unrestricted? Um, what's your view on identity politics? Is it required by your view? Compatible with your view? Or incompatible with your view? If you have answers to these questions, you've thought about these things a lot more than most people do. Most people's uh, commitments are much vaguer than that. It's not to say you can't have precise commitments. What, I, what my claim is, if you have precise commitments here, you're like the theologian or the philosopher of religion, who of course has uh, pretty distinct religious concepts. But the reason they have pre pretty distinct religious uh, uh, concepts is they have a history and a tradition of interpreting what was initially pretty indistinct and didn't commit them to precisely those concepts. They could have gone, uh, they could have made decisions to cash those concepts out in other ways. They had some content. It's not as though you could be uh, uh, a liberal democrat and think, you know, I think Killing people for no reason is a good idea, generally speaking. Uh, you know, your views have some content. That's is a very silly example, but um, there are, there, there are the, your views have content which distinguishes you from, say, a conservative. But the content is pretty vague, such that if you are to have precise answers to all these questions, it's because you have worked through systematizing that content and in doing so made decisions to develop in one way rather than another. Um, some data. Uh, Moaz et al. 2002 gave their subjects peace proposals for uh, peace between Palestinians and the Israelis. The subjects were Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. The finding was, so the, mani so the manipulation was this peace proposal has been, um, a pr was put forward by an Israeli working group. This peace proposal was um, put forward by a Palestinian working group. The finding was that that manipulation predicted people's attitudes to the peace proposal, not the peace proposal content. Being told this is a proposal put forward by people with whom you identify leads people to say that's a good proposal, which is evidence that the actual content of people's views is pretty vague. Cohen replicated this in the US. This it was, I don't know, four or five experiments. Uh, the only one I can remember right now used welfare policies. And the manipulation was similar. They were told that this uh, policy has been uh, put forward by House Democrats or House Republicans. Much more strongly predictive of attitudes to the policy than the actual content. So, for example, people who identified as on the liberal in the, U in the US sense of the term, the liberal end of the spectrum, preferred harsh policies 
harsh welfare policies over lenient ones if they were told that the lenient ones were approved of, uh, by Republicans and the harsh ones by Democrats, and vice versa. Um, that's both work from the early 2000s. Much more recent work on choice blindness, I think, supports the same thing. The choice blindness paradigm is a lovely little experimental paradigm. You get people to make choices, hence the name, and the choices are recorded on or represented by cards. Um, you know, I've got Patrick to answer the question. I say, okay, so this is your answer. I put it in the Patrick pile and go ask him a few more questions and keep adding to the pile until I've got the pile of cards that represents Patrick's choices. The, uh, the cool thing, uh, that's a technical term, is on some trials, the experimenters who are in fact trained magicians use sleight of hand to substitute cards, unchosen choices for those that are chosen. So in among Patrick's pile, there'll be some which he hasn't chosen. And then I, uh, the next stage is, okay, here are your choices. Can you tell me why you chose this one? Can you defend your choice? And on most trials, most people don't notice the substitution and go on to defend the choice they, in fact, didn't make quite smoothly and articulately. This has been demonstrated, choice blindness has been demonstrated for moral views and also political views. So, um, Paul Johansson and Strandberg, 2013, I think, uh, what they did is they re used real policies from an upcoming, then imminent, uh, election in Sweden, stopped people in the public park, asked them, and did this, this, this experiment with them, asked them, what do you think of these policies? Real policies, uh, they had to indicate their support or opposition on a nine-point po uh, scale from, you know, uh, strongly agree through to strongly disagree. Uh, even those people who use the extreme ends of the nine-point scale, one-third of them failed to notice that they were being asked to defend a choice they had not in fact made and went on to defend it. I think that's what exactly what you should expect if most people's views on most moral issues and political issues are pretty vague. Why? Uh, do I support that? Well, that's because uh, people like me support it, or in this case, because he has good evidence I do support it, so I must, right? I chose it. I guess um, it must be because, well, look at it. Look at their welfare policy. That's clearly the right welfare policy, right? Um, and I think, you know, if you think about the recent US election, how, <laughs> well, that's probably not a good idea but in any case. Uh, think about how people went from widely seeing Trump as the antithesis of Republican values to the embodiment. In the end, 95% of registered Republicans voted for, for Trump. Now you can see why you might think Trump is the antithesis of Republican values. I don't know. Multiple uh, marriages, uh, affairs, pussy grabbing, vulgarity, um, used to be a Democrat, apparent uh, uh, complete lack of theological beliefs. You can also see why he can be the, seen as the uh, apotheosis or the embodiment of Republican values, free markets against political correctness, um, all these signals about global warming and um, immigrants. Um, it's quite easy to see how your average Republican could easily go from, from saying, he's completely opposed to everything I believe in, to he embodies what I believe in relatively quickly. And I'm not accusing Republicans here of irrationality claiming we all have pretty vague moral and political views, except insofar as we have made them distinct. Which we will tend, to, people in this room will tend to have done to a much greater degree than other people. But still, I still think you better believe it for a whole lot of propositions. And of course, I do too. 
I think we made her represent a lot of empirical claims. Um, Sperber gives the example of children, to, children who say germs cause disease. Uh, he thinks that's a meta-representation. In a loose sense, it is, insofar as they don't have very distinct concepts of germs. Uh, Sperber thinks that's sort of scaffolding for concept acquisition. Well, maybe it is, but I think a lot of us never acquire very determinant uh, uh, concepts. So, uh, I guess we all believe viruses cause disease. Do any of us have very distinct representations of viruses? Not particularly. Stuhlman did a nice study um, of 10 years ago now, looking at Princeton undergraduates, uh, including Princeton biology majors, and found that accepting the proposition, evolution is true, failed to correlate with having a distinct notion of what evolution was actually about. Uh, uh, people uh, had very little idea of what they were actually committing to when they said that evolution um, is true. Now, so I claim that meta-representations, remember how I'm using that word, are common. I also claim that all by themselves they can explain many, not all, mismatch cases. So think about the, the child who represents that germs cause disease. They can make inferences over that meta-representation without having much content. They need some, some content, but not, a, not much to make some inferences. They can conclude that they ought to wash their hands before eating. Uh, somebody who believes ger uh, viruses, an adult who believes viruses cause disease may have indistinct representations of viruses and causation and diseases, but still might want to use an antiviral agent. I think that, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to use an antiviral agent because viruses um, cause diseases. Someone who has no idea what they're signing up to and saying evolution is true um, may make inferences over that meta-representation. They may, for example, choose to vote for one candidate and not another because the other candidate says they're creationists. Uh, that's inference over the meta-representation without requiring very much in the way of content of the first order representation. Uh, given that it does have some content though, it can be expected to drive some inference, some behavior all by itself. Um, but at the same time, given the indistinctness of the first order representation, there's a zone of latitude. There's a zone in which my behavior can be uh, inconsistent. Certainly it can conflict with what is the best way of cashing out the, the content of my indistinct representation. So for example, uh, I, of many of those Princeton undergraduates, biology undergraduates, who accepted that evolution was true, behaved inconsistently with that. Now, they didn't behave inconsistently with their own first order representation because it was too indistinct. Nevertheless, they uh, behaved inconsistently with the best way of cashing out uh, that proposition that evolution is true. So they, they, for example, made inferences which were teleological. You know, they, 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 uh, they postulated that certain biological events happened because the animal uh, or the species wanted certain things to happen, which of course can't, uh, natural selection doesn't have foresight in that kind of way. They substituted Lamarckianism for um, Darwin, Darwinism and so forth. So they were able to behave inconsistently with their own first order representation without their being able to see any inconsistency themselves because the, the first order representation was you know, subjectively too inconsistent, too indistinct for there to be any actual inconsistency. And you know, think of the Trump voter. Uh, they may have gone 
from uh, believing that Trump is incompatible with everything they, be, uh, they believe in to thinking he embodies everything they believe in, which is inconsistency over time. But both may be com entirely compatible with the content of the first order uh, representation. All right, I want to return to the case of Daniel. Uh, I want to return to the case of Daniel because Daniel's case has certain features which make it a bit of a challenge for the meta-representation account, but I think allows us to fill it out in a way that's you know, responding to the challenges. It allows us to fill it out in a way we might not otherwise have done. Um, so the reason why Daniel's a challenge is unlike uh, Boyer's in informants who say, you know, uh, well, I don't know, the ancestors don't have eyes, but they don't not have eyes, and uh, what are you asking these silly questions for? Um, or or the, the person who eats the food destined for the gods but doesn't, isn't bothered by any apparent inconsistency. Unlike them, Daniel notices and is troubled by, <coughs> Eric stipulates, the inconsistency in his behavior. So again, it's important to me that the stipulation is a realistic one. But I think it is. Uh, I don't have data. Strikes me as highly uh, uh, plausible. It's like Eric. I can think, well, there's a lot of me in Daniel. Um, that entails that Daniel's representation has enough content that he can notice there's an inconsistency, that there is an inconsistency for him. I still think the meta-representation account can get a grip on the case. Uh, there are actually two ways of filling it out, which I think are both compatible with the meta-representation uh, um, account. The first is one I suspect is more common in which it's not the case that Daniel notices any or at least very many token inconsistencies between how he's acting and what he believes. Uh, if you think about the literature on implicit bias, think about the effort we need to go to to uh, probe implicit biases. Uh, and even then, we know there's an implicit bias at work because we look at the hiring decisions of the personnel manager or we look at the decisions of the experimental um, participants. Uh, it's clear that from the pattern that there's bias at work because uh, this is not a random distribution. But you can't infer from this experimental work that this particular person is biased. I think that's, that's uh, very often the case, that we are worried that we don't live up to our commitments in some area, but we're not sure that we, there's no token act, or very few, of which we say, that's when I didn't live up to my commitments. Um, there may be a few, but then, you know, slips happen to everyone. Um, instead, you may be worried by the pattern. Now, I think the meta-representation account can explain this. And one thing to recognize here is that words like equality and respect are indistinct. They require interpretation. On anyone's view, they don't just apply themselves. And one way to bring this out is to think what's, what in, what's required by exhibiting or manifesting equal respect. You can, ease, you can think of two people in similar circumstances who behave in similar ways to me uh, such that if I respond identically I show one respect and the other one disrespect. So one example is say my neighbor does me a favor and even though it was a favor I don't owe him anything I give him a gift or, 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 or some money. A friend does me a similar favor and I give her some money that could be really manifesting disrespect it could be really incompatible with relation of friendship. So things like equality and friendship require interpretation. As a result, it's very hard to equate or even to commensurate manifestations of respect. Um, 
given they have this indistinctness built in, for each token act, Daniel may think, that may have been right, what was required, but then looking at the pattern of his interpretations across time, he's worried. He may think, well, I, I give it a, I give my equal respect, uh, more restrictive or, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't know. Um, a, a less generous interpretation when it's certain people and not others. Um, so his representation may be sufficiently distinct, such that looking at the pattern, he's worried that it conflicts. But nevertheless, it's sufficiently indistinct that for each token occasion, he can't identify. Um, conflict and this indistinctness may explain why uh, the pattern's able to manifest itself that uh, he can interpret his values in certain and his commitments in certain ways on some occasions in a different way uh, on other occasions without it being the case that he's ever acting genuinely inconsistently uh, with the representations. All right, the harder case is when Daniel can identify a sufficient number of token manifestations of respect. Even. Damn it. I interrupted those people, that was rude. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, damn it, I deferred to that person just because of their title. I shouldn't have done that. Even then, I think the meta-representation account can get a grip on what's going on. So, your first order belief E, belief E state, can have sufficient content such that you're capable of noticing inconsistencies. Uh, but like the religious believer who needs their religious beliefs primed before they engage in effortful deliberation over the, or effortful inference over the representation. They just may not be salient for you in most contexts. Uh, they may not be automatically activated in many contexts, um, such that they don't guide online behavior in real time. So Daniel may find himself interrupting the conversation between you know, the fast food workers uh, before he realizes that's not con uh, consistent with my commitments. Were his representation uh, more um, distinct, it would behave, it would play this online role in governing behavior. All right, um, just some remarks to uh, finish up. Uh, I'm not at all claiming that the meta-representation account is the account of discordancy cases or mismatch cases. There's a huge variety out there and I want to emphasize that heterogeneity. I want to mention a rift that goes through them. I don't want to claim that this is the only rift that divides all cases neatly into one and the other and we need two accounts to account for this rift. But I just want to mention uh, a rift which seems to sort meta-representation apt cases on one side and those which I suspect need a different story on the other. And that's uh, a rift between those which are resource sensitive and those which are not. A lot of the cases, like standard A-leaf cases, um, that phobias is a good case for an A-leaf explanation, are sensitive to the what you might call type 2 resource availability. So under conditions of stress, of cognitive load, uh, uh, when uh, time is critical, responses have to be made very quickly, you get behavior that is less consistent with what the person believes, professes to believe, whereas under conditions in which uh, resources are available and people have time and the capacity, resources, uh, cognitive resources for reflection, their behavior tends to be more in line uh, with what they believe. Um, 
and if you think about psychologists' paradigms for priming a whole lot of, say, implicit states, they tend to use cognitive load, multitasking, dual task pra uh, paradigms, or speeded response, or misdirection to reduce the power of type 2 processes in order to get at these implicit states. Meta-representation cases look pretty, not entirely, but pretty resource indifferent. Um, Daniel may be disposed to behave a little more in line with his professed commitments under times of uh, uh, under conditions which are deliberation conducive, but deliberation conduciveness won't be sufficient to bring all this behaviour into line with, with his professed beliefs. A lot of them, uh, the, in, um, if you think about cases from the um, cognitive science of religion, in a lot of them the participants are asked to reflect, but the concepts are not salient enough to, uh, for the person to engage in ethical deliberation over them. They could, were the concepts salient, but they're not salient enough. So, uh, uh, meta-representation uh, uh, cases fall on one side of that divide. That's just uh, to motivate, again, the heterogeneity claim. That the heterogeneity of cases, some of them involve lesions, for example. Capra well, delusions commonly, not universally, but commonly involve brain lesions. And we should probably expect different accounts to uh, explanations of those to those which are much more everyday. Uh, I also want to mention a, re a closely related account. And that's the account developed by Greg Curry and Ian Ravenscroft, uh, which is clearly in the same ballpark. Um, they developed their account, as far as I know, they haven't attempted to extend it more broadly. They um, developed their account as an account of clinical delusions. On their account, delusional patients don't believe what they say they believe. Rather, they just imagine what they say they believe. But they believe that they believe it. Um, there are a couple of differences from Curry and Ravenscroft. One is that they require that people are mistaken about their own, the kind of attitude their representations are, which I think is a hard thing to be mistaken about. Now, they, they cite the lesion, they say it's a failure of source monitoring due to the lesion. So that's not an objection to their account as an account of delusion cases, but we shouldn't expect it to apply very often to cases in which there's no lesion to do the explanatory work. Um, so I think my account is much more parsimonious and much more plausible as an explanation of non-delusion cases uh, uh, than theirs is because it doesn't require that people are mistaken about the kind of attitude they're taking to content. We really do take a beliefy attitude to our first order content. Uh, it's just not a belief, but why would we be able to see that? You can't see the systematicity. Uh, it's not built into your own uh, states uh, in any way that's introspectable. Um, okay, so I claim that the meta-representation account can explain a broad variety of mismatch cases. I don't know how uh, broad, but uh, I, I suspect there, there are very many. We should believe it because the best explanation of a whole uh, range of both data syst and systematic observation and unsystematic observation is that we, we have lots and lots of meta-representations about all sorts of things, particularly uh, normative stuff, uh, but empirical stuff too. When things are hard to represent, like the theory of evolution, um, e equals mc squared. Gee, I think that's true. What the hell do I mean by that? Um, we have lots of meta-representations. These meta-representations will drive, on the one hand, our assertion, because when, when I'm asked what I believe, I, other things being equal, I tend to report what I believe I believe, and, unless it's opposed by other stuff, and it isn't in this case. Uh, but it constitutes 
a zone of latitude such that my behavior can be inconsistent over time and inconsistent with the best way of actually filling out what I take myself to believe. Yeah, thank you.